This program was produced by Brookdale Community College, Lincroft, New Jersey. Hello, I'm Jack Needle, Director of the Center for Holocaust Studies at Brookdale Community College, which is presenting this series, Witness to Holocaust. Today, we continue with Arthur Danzinger's Odyssey of Survival. When it became obvious that the Nazis were intent in their persecution of the Jews, there was an attempt to save the Jewish children a series of exoduses to take these children from Germany and Austria to England was called the Kinder Transport. Mr. Danziger was one of those children. Unfortunately, his uncle took him from the train as soon as it had crossed the border into Holland. Within the year, the Nazis occupied Holland. Mr. Danzinger had to assume new identities in safe houses that were provided by the Dutch underground. A cat and mouse game began in earnest. Hiding and escaping became the constant normality of life. I remember we were evacuated on May 10th from where we were to Alkma, which is another city in northern uh, Holland. If I'm correct, um, my geography is so-so. And we came together with the German paratroopers. As we were coming with, by train, the German paratroopers were jumping in the same city. So it was, they wanted to flood the plane over there. But they didn't do it. A lot of them, was, uh, there was quite a big deal of uh, of uh, fifth column uh, and sympathizers, Dutch sympathizers, and they um, just didn't uh, execute the orders. So there was no flooding. We all got back over there, and we were over there. Restricted, we had curfews and things like that, and we couldn't go any place. We were going with the South David right away since May 40. We had a yellow star, was written in Dutch, Jod, Jude. So the anti Semitic laws were passed immediately? Immediately. Restrictions. And um, Holland was, uh, I mean, the, the action of uh, making Holland Unright, which went together with the rest of Europe, was ex executed in 1943. Mm -hmm. Now, d during this period, though, you, you said you lived uh, uh, on a... Oh, in, from 40 to 42, we were in a youth center. A youth center. Yes. We were about 72 boys and girls up to the age of 18. Um, about 70% German refugees. Th these were all Jewish children? All Jewish. And you were being trained in agriculture, agriculture for, for Israel? For Israel. Yes. And uh, later on, when, when the Germans came, and they started uh, with their actions, they started before 43 to arrest Jews and to deport them from Westerbork, which was a transit camp over there. And uh, the organization, which were uh, probably the Israeli, uh, um, they had um, 
persons, um, in instructors from Israel. They probably got in touch with the Dutch underground. Because we were in 1942, we were warned uh, that we would be um, arrested. And I remember it was on a Friday night, and everybody was uh, called up in emergency session. I was at that, I was at the youngest with another kid. And uh, we were instructed that we would go in stages, leave the, leave the place, and we would be picked up by members of the underground. And that's what happened. Uh, like I said, we the two youngest, we went first. And I remember. Yeah, a fellow came with a bicycle. So, so at this stage, you were how old? I was in 1942, 16. 16 years old. Yes. And you and this other boy were the youngest. We so were the youngest over there. And uh, the fellow came. I had a knapsack with me, with clothing, and uh, like I said, vitamins they gave us, which were a big help later on, which we didn't uh, understand in the beginning. It, it, but you attribute that to helping save your life, having the strength to... Yes, absolutely, because we didn't get anything to eat. I remember our, our ration was a handful of um, cornmeal a week. A week? Yes. And uh, it was pretty weak. We ran into a, um, a barrier, um, a gate. And to my luck, there was a ditch right next to the road. And I jumped in the ditch, and the fellow, the Dutch fellow, they opened up right away the Germans. And uh, they asked what was the matter. He said he was on the road to the end there, and he had a flat tire, and he got late and was careful already. So for some unknown reason, they didn't bother him. It was Air Force. so. Air Force was Air Force was Bermuda. They were not SS or something. They were not so vicious. So they told them, you better be careful. You have police and, and uh, they stay the shite things on the road. Be careful. So he said, of course, thank you. They closed the gate and I jumped back on the road on a bicycle. And we proceeded uh, to the uh, to a place in Boston, which is a small town over there. And the first people I met over there was a teacher. And it turned out to be that the whole group who took care of us, they belonged to uh, how do they go? Montessori School. Montessori School, yes. Yes. They were all uh, teachers and employees and principal of that school. And they had they took us over. No, they, they had contacts with the underground? Yes, they were underground. They were underground? Yes, they were underground. And um, quite a few of them, matter of fact, the, the principal I was just mentioning, he was shot. He was caught with a group of our boys in uh, Pyrenees, tried to get uh, our friends to Spain. And he wound up, he was shot in Holland. They brought him back. Uh, from all the 72 children who were over there, only a handful survived. I mean, a handful. Most of them were either caught, and a small group came to Israel. They had the kibbutz over there. So, um, it is sad because there were some really smart kids over there, intelligent, bright kids. And they wound up in Auschwitz or whatever. One kid, I remember. This is, I don't know, grapevines. You know, you got information, and it turned out to be correct from Auschwitz. One of the nicest guys over there wound up in a, in a crematorium pulling teeth. 
but uh, in the crematorium was uh, they were 90 days candidates. After 90 days, I got shot, and somebody else came up. The first job of those who came up was to bury the dead one commando before them, the Zandos. I went up as one of the teachers of, of the Montessori school, and I was uh, in Eric. The only thing which was good over there, they had a library over there in that room. So it was like a jail. I never got out. I remember the only time I ever got, because somehow I got twice to the same place. And she had two daughters. And I remember one, one evening, my daughter come, and I never got out. I never went out of that room. I was sitting over there. And I didn't mind too much, because uh, I had books or what. But uh, one, one evening, the, the woman came and said, you go with my daughter. Okay. So I, I went down and I saw him. next door there was another Jewish boy. And I had a short conversation with him. But she said, Don't don't waste your time, let's go. So we took a walk. Took a walk and I enjoyed it very much, you know, <laughs> and just so many weeks in a in a room cooped up. And then all of a sudden they went up, went up by summertime. Anyway, what, what was the reason for the walk? It was, was a razzia. A razzia is, a, what is it? A, a roundup. A roundup of, of um, respected uh, undergrounds and people were hiding, things like this. And uh, they somehow had gotten the word that was coming. And that was the reason why I took a walk. The boy next door wasn't anymore. He got caught. At the same time, the one I spoke to, and I only saw him for a few minutes. He, he went up in Westerbrook, he went up in a transit camp. In 1943, they started with um, deporting a wholesale Amsterdam. They emptied the Jewish uh, uh, quarter. In Amsterdam, it's very easy to to do that. How to do you pull up the bridges? Everything is canals over there. So um, they they rounded up the, all all Amsterdam and all the other cities. And it is sad to say that about more of the the countries were emancipated, and uh, but more. The, the people were well off, the sooner they died, because they just couldn't adjust to the, those conditions in the camps. Well, the many of the people from Poland, as you, as you probably know, they were living in secluded, and they were living in small villages and working on farms, and was not farms, they were not farms. They didn't, were not allowed to have grounds. But uh, they were poor, basically. A lot of them were poor, and they, they, they knew what hunger was. So they were more resistant to the surrounding than those people who came over there who were either well-to-do or, or uh, always had the easy life. They were always employed in Amsterdam was uh, diamond cutters and things like this. They built professional people. And they died like flies. And only a small percentage came back from Holland. I, th I think 70% of the Jews that were rounded up died. Yes. Small percentage came back. I was, I'm 42. I was knocking around from one place to another. And I, I met a range of different uh, people in the society. I was a week with bankers. And the other week I was with somebody with 10 children who was uh, a guard on a crossing or something like that. It's very poor, but still, 
they kept me. And, and this was wanted. the underground moving you from one, one, That's right. I, I one never safe knew where place I was. to another. Mm -hmm. I never knew where I was. The only thing I knew, I was in Rotterdam. Why did I know I was in Rotterdam? Because Rotterdam was bombed. The center of city wasn't there. That's the only clue I had that I was in Rotterdam. It was the first city which was bombed by the Germans in 1940. <coughs> For no reasons. Because they were surrendering anyway. And a lot of casualties. And, uh, and I traveled all over the country and most of the time by myself in the room. In 1943, I came, and was, I came, I was brought to a uh, farm and I was working over there supposedly as a volunteer. I had papers, which I mentioned before, I was revived. That's somebody who died and they took the paper and gave them to me. And I was supposed to be a student who volunteered for agriculture and uh, Aryan, of course. Uh, my first experience on the farm was that I was sick for six weeks because I didn't know how to di digest the food. I get slight sort of typhoid diarrhea. Couldn't, couldn't digest the food. To reach. After six weeks, finally slowed down and I worked hard, but I didn't mind. And uh, it was strange over there in the, on the farm. I was like lost in space because I didn't have no radios, I didn't have no papers, no nothing. But uh, that's the way they live over there in farms. And uh, in 1944, I've been working, we used to work from summertime from 4.30 to 9.30, 10 o'clock during harvest time, as long as there was light. We used to work with combine, things like this, dragging how not kilo bags all day long, but I didn't mind. But um, anyway, in, um, in uh, I would say it was August or something, I got this is round, again a round of Germans on the Wehrmacht. I was taken for fortification, digging trenches, anti-tank trenches, stuff like that. So that this was a roundup to, to get workers for them? Yes. And uh, we worked over there in maybe a month or something, three weeks, a month. And, um, and, and, and again, you said this was 1944. Yes, sir. And this was September? No, August. 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 August because so the I was invasion liberated. had taken place. Yes, sir. They were on, on the threshold of the German. And, and you right. said this was General Hodge's army? First army, the, yes. The first army was coming in. Yes. <laughs> Later on, the elements of the pattern came through with the third army, the armored divisions. But basically, at that time, it was Hodges who liberated. So um, I worked uh, months over there, and uh, I left over there on my own. Not because the German wanted me to leave, but I got from the one of the Germans over there reports that the S was taken over the next day. And by coincidence, it, the, the road was attacked by American planes. We were strafed and bombed. And during all that confusion, everybody was jumping into the ditches. Me and another fellow, we jumped out of the ditches and we went back to the village where they took us from. And I came over there. So you, you had been warned that the SS was going to take over the, the next, next day? day. Yes. And we, we took advantage of the air attack to get out of there. So uh, we came back and uh, again I, I ran into Germans, but this was already the approaching of the American army 
up the first army. They was fighting and I was uh, bringing with a horse and a uh, wagon. I was bringing food and, and ammunition. And uh, I remember the Americans came during the night. And I don't know, I almost got shot by American sentry. Because um, they were all around, they were in uh, meadows over there. They were, um, they had um, the equipment over the trucks and, and everything in jeeps. And uh, it was an infantry uh, division. And everybody had duck work salt. But the sentries and officers, they were inside in a, in a barn. And I, I slept over there, I don't know. How I somehow I must have gotten after supper. I was on my way back to this. And this guy challenged me, and I had go click. And uh, I remembered a little bit of English, so I told them the story. So he said, "Okay, go ahead." So that that was it. So that was your your first meeting with an American. It was first meeting with an American, and I was happy. He maybe want to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you knew you were liberated then at that Absolutely, point. yes. Absolutely. And I shall never forget one thing which happened in the course of a few days over there, which was after the, the cross the Rhine in at Remagen, somehow they got a bridge over there, and uh, thousands of Americans died. How do I know that? There is a, a large um, cemetery in Margaretten, Margaretten, which is next to where I was. And they started out with nothing. By the time I left, which was in May, there um, were maybe about over 30,000 soldiers buried over there. They didn't bury Americans and German. They were brought back to, um, to Holland. And um, I want to, to say something else. Uh, I remember one time, a few days after I got liberated, they came a whole convoy with troops, infantry, and they stopped. And we didn't hear one syllable. Absolutely dead. We just saw the trucks. Nobody spoke a word. And I don't know, you're not you're, you're curious what was the reason. So I, I, I went over to one of the trucks and said, uh, you know Jan Holland? You know, I'm out of this, this word that Jan Holland, all of, them, all of a sudden was like explosion. Everybody started yelling and talking. They thought they were in Germany. First of all, they were not allowed to speak to Germans. And besides this, they were tense. Just the idea of being in Germany or going to Germany because they were going to the lines. All of a sudden, it was just pandemonium broke out. They were so happy of being in Holland. I never have seen something like this the outbreak of happiness <laughs> between the soldiers. It struck me. Then. <clears throat> you you uh, decided on, on leaving Holland. Yes, I decided uh, on leaving Holland, and I decided to go to Israel, which I did. But before, somehow they took us as a uh, few were left over from from the Hashra. They took us like a nucleus of. Uh, veterans who, who were familiar with Israel and, and who had ID, ideals about Israel going over there. So um, they kept us a year over there, a very year. We were in Côte d'Azur in uh, the French Riviera. But uh, I don't know, somehow I feel bad. Why me? And I feel bad. I think about my aunt, who was killed in Sabibor. 
he was picked up in Amsterdam. He died in Zabibor. My grandfather was the first Jew who was killed in Benjin, in Poland. They had fun with him. They cut up with the bayonet his beard and they shot him in the street. He had the distinction of being the first youth to be shot. And all my family and uh, my father's family, I didn't know them. I knew them because I once went uh, to a wedding. I was seven years old. So I don't remember them, but uh, they were killed. They were killed. There was my wife's care. Uh, there were five children. He was the only one left. And she never got over that. Her father died in Grossrosen in Auschwitz. No, it's not Grossrosen, not in Auschwitz. Grossrosen is in Germany. In near the Polish German border. And uh, yeah. Have you ever sought any support from other survivors in the United States? To no. So you, you've borne this 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 problem of uh, of pain and guilt by yourself. Yeah. Yes. So, so you're you're still a victim of the, the Nazis. I would say so. Yes. Absolutely. We we want to thank you, Arthur, for sharing these very very terrible, painful memories with us. And hopefully, this uh, this record of history will try to ensure that something like this never happens again. Thank you. I hope so that I contribute something to it.